So as I said in the previous video, I really want to look at the new deployment process that's involved for OpenStack versions after Usuri. So specifically, we'll focus on Wallaby and we'll talk about anything after Wallaby. It's important that we start to understand this new deployment process, some of the benefits and some of the things that we're going to have to wrap our minds around to adjust to these new changes. So all of this and the reasoning behind this is covered fairly well in this networking version 2 document on the Triple O docs page. Now there is some Triple O specs that I'm going to link below related to ephemeral heat and the Networks V2 stuff that are all going to give the background for why this is necessary. But essentially the high level overview is that with ephemeral heat we're starting an isolated pod that starts up and runs all of the heat services within the pod and then that that can't reach the catalog, it can't talk to Neutron, so it just starts up and it goes away and spits out all the Ansible playbooks that we're going to use based on the environment files and the triple O heat templates that are provided to it. So, you know, it can't reach Ironic either, so it can't provision those servers for you. And there is benefits to that because we were, you know, for so long seeing this error that's just no valid host that would be returned from the Nova filters when it can't find a valid host. And then you would need to check the scheduler logs and find out which filter failed and then look at what that filter is doing and understand how you can then resolve that problem. So this is much better in that it allows for a bit more granular control over it. We don't have the flavors, we don't have to match up an ironic node to a Nova flavor and then use all of the Nova mechanisms to provision the VM. We're simply using ironic and we've done that by creating a wrapper script called Metalsmith that sits around all of the complexity and makes it easier to manage. Um, one of the things that you can't do is run OpenStack server list to get the IPs, so Metalsmith takes care of that, for example, where we do Metalsmith list and it spits out the IPs and the names of the nodes that have been deployed. So if we look at this networking v2 document, we can see that we have to go through a couple of steps. So the first thing we need to do is provision the networks, then we provision any VIPs that will be applicable to our environment, and then finally we do the node provision, and that uses all the data created in the previous two steps, such as the networks that have been created in Neutron, the VIPs that have been created, and it will go and provision the nodes. And now we can pass it a dash dash network config, which will actually run the OSNet config component of the deployment as part of this provisioning process. So it's really broken down into more manageable and easier to troubleshoot chunks. If your network provisioning fails, you know that you're just looking at a network provisioning issue related to the undercloud with Neutron. That's much easier to debug than running over cloud deploy and waiting you know, five to 10 minutes and then finding out there's a problem and you need to figure out where you need to look. This is a more targeted approach to doing these deployments and it gives you a more manageable chunk of the deployment to troubleshoot at any one time. So when we provision the nodes, if we add dash dash network config and that fails, then that's a fundamental thing that needs to work before the overcloud deploy is going to work. So that, that gives us that ability to make sure all that and all the fundamentals in our cloud are there before we even start with our deployment. So the first thing we do is we create a file which is similar to our network data.yaml file from previous OpenStack versions. This one we're going to call network data v2. And it looks a little bit different. It's all this YAML format and it's all broken up into chunks like this. And we, we can have a look at an example. So this is a full example of a networks v2 file. So we can see here we have our storage network, storage management, internal API, tenant, and external. Obviously you can add customizable networks to this as well and it will go ahead and create them. And then we set VIP to true, VIP to false, whatever it is on that network. If we need VIPs, we can create them. If we don't, we don't need to. And then we use this file and we pass it into our OpenStack Overcloud Network Provision command. And we want to create an output, an environment file that we'll then use with our Overcloud Deploy command. And we pass it as an input, that network v2 file. So we switch over to my terminal here. And we'll have a look at my network data YAML file. So this is the same file we're just looking at, except this is information relevant to my information. So I'm giving it a DNS domain, storage, storage management, going through, assigning it all the IP addresses. These are all just the defaults, um, the VLANs, whether or not we're going to be creating VIPs. The only one that's really different to the defaults is this external network, where this subnet is relevant to my router, and we looked at that in my network diagram. And this is all on VLAN 4. 
So to work with this and to run that deployment, what we do is we take this command, we'll paste it in here, and we just need to change the directory because mine is not in the home directory, it's in templates, and then we run that command. Now this will run a bunch of Ansible playbooks that will ultimately talk to Neutron on the undercloud and provision those nodes. I've already done it, so I'm going to be overriding the, the file and we'll see a lot of these won't, won't actually change. Okay, so once that script is finished, if you export OS cloud equals undercloud and then do OpenStack network list, you'll see that you have all of the networks here, including the control plane network. The control plane network though is created during the undercloud install. So now that we have our networks, we can go ahead and create our VIPs. So what does a VIP data file look like? Well, this is an example of one here. So basically we configure any networks that we would like to have VIPs on. Now I'm just gonna use this default example We'll go into templates and we'll create a file called vipdata, vipdata.yaml, paste that in, uh, hold on, set paste which will make sure everything is in a line properly. Now our vip, this is not the vip we want to use, but we do have one that we were using in our previous AAA deployment. So we do dig, over, uh, dig open stack .bne homenet at 192.168.1.231, which is our DNS server. We don't have dig. So this is important. So let's install blind utils. We're going to use it all the time. So we'll run that dig command again. We'll just pass it short. So the IP address. And the VIP we want to use is this one, just so we don't need to change DNS records and all that kind of stuff. So we have vipdata.yaml and we'll paste in this IP address. So once we have those VIP, that VIP file configured, we're going to run a very similar command, but it will be over cloud network VIP provision now. So we'll pass it in this, again change our path, templates, vipdata.yaml. I actually haven't done this step, so this is the we're actually watching this happen for the first time. Okay, so that has created a conflict. So let's just check the port list and we'll get a IP address that is free in the environment. So that we can read it on this half screen, keep our documentation open. Okay, so 20, yeah, 24.5 is already allocated, so let's go and change that in here. So we'll do 24.25 and keep our VIPs on the same last octet. Let's run that again and see how that goes. Okay, there we go. So now that has finished and that will have created a file called overcloud VIP deployment here. So that's our VIPs that will get included as an environment file when we run our overcloud deploy. And the previous command created overcloud network. This is overcloud networks deployed. And again, this is just information that gets passed into our overcloud deploy command. So the final step after we've done all that, then we're ready to provision our bare metal instances. Now this one needs a new file that in this case I've called bare metal env. And we basically want to go through here and we want to define our node counts for the roles, for example. So I'm deploying one controller here. Now this is, for me, I'm setting managed false. I'm not using Ironic to provision these nodes. If you're doing a traditional deployment with bare metal nodes and you want Ironic to provision them with the operating system, you wouldn't include this line here. This is simply because mine are virtual machines running in CMV and Ironic has no way to control them. So I've manually configured that like we saw in the last video. If you missed that, go check out the last video and I'll show some of the things that we need to do to configure those nodes. There's still some additional stuff we need to configure. So that combined with what I showed today will be the full scope of what we need to do. So we set this to false in my case. Then we want to tell it which networks we're going to provision on this node. And if we want to use fixed IP addresses, which a lot of people have previously enjoyed using fixed IPs. So I'm giving some examples of how to use fixed IPs here to make them predictable. 
And this one down here is not using a predictable IP. So we'll see the storage management network actually generate an IP address for us. Now this is completely different and fundamentally changed from how it was in previous versions of OpenStack. If you were using predictable IPs previously, you would need to go through the indexes. So you would have a list called external subnet. And then under that, you would have the list of IP addresses. And those IP addresses need to match the index of the node so like this index here in our node, if it was controller zero, that would correspond to the zero index in the array of IP addresses. So if you don't need predictable IPs, obviously this is a lot easier. We can just delete this fixed IP component and it will go ahead and create IP addresses on each of those subnets for you. But I wanted to make sure there's an example of how we can use fixed IP addresses as well. Now, the other thing we can do in this file, if you're using Ironic, and I want to touch on it for the majority of people who will, is we can specifically assign nodes to bare metal modes. So for example, over here on the right hand side, we can see in the documentation under instances, we have hostname overcloud controller zero is on node zero zero. So that will assign our overcloud controller zero to the bare metal node registered as node zero zero. So obviously not applicable to me in, in this environment with pre-provisioned servers, but for everyone else, this will be relevant and this is obviously a lot easier than matching up with um, the way we used to do it with flavors or with uh, matching the node selectors for example. So here's a broader example of that file. Um, you can also specify the image you want to use. So if you have a custom overcloud full image, maybe you've set the root password, you can provide that here. So there's lots of other good examples in this in this file. It's probably worth going through and reading through it for yourself and making sure you have a good understanding of um, how this is all provisioned and how it all works. So in addition to that, the final thing we have is this, this network template down here. So we are defining which network template we will use with the deployment. And this is one we copied from our previous deployment. We VR this file, we can see that it's just a Jinja2 file and it goes through and creates an OVS bond called bond one. We've put in the interfaces that we want. So in this case, we have an extra nick. This isn't just copying the, the default that you see here, um, where we only have one nick at the top. So that's this one. But then I've gone ahead and added a sec uh, second one, which will actually be the first interface in my environment. And that connects back to the OpenShift uh, pod network. So I've just set that to use DHCP, for example. Then in the next one, that will be our control plane and the final two will go into our OVS bond. Now I did touch on this in the previous video, but it's important, so we'll do it again. So if we want to know what NIC1, NIC2, NIC3, NIC4 actually map to, we did look at this in the previous video, but we'll touch on it again here because it has the most relevance to us now. So if we go back to our bare metal end, we can see that I've configured some static IPs for the control plane. So we'll use this one as our example. So we can log into that node. Now on this node, we need to run OS net config dash I and we do it with sudo. And that will give us a mapping of what the NICs actually map to. So we can see here that NIC1 maps to ETH0, NIC2 to ETH1, NIC3, ETH2, example, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that leads to the next point of some of the prerequisites we need on this node. We need to have OSNet config and open vSwitch installed on the node. So in this case, what I've done is I just copied over the, the repos. So I just SCP'd all of the repos from my director node over to each of my overcloud nodes. Then on the overcloud node, I copied them into the Etsy yum repos D directory. So then we just do sudo dnf install open vSwitch and os net config, and that will go and install those packages that are prerequisites to running this network configuration. So once that's done, and once we know what our network's mapped to, then we are able to go back and edit that network config file. Now both of my nodes are exactly the same, exactly the same interfaces, so I can use exactly the same template. If you have a different combination of nodes with different network interfaces, maybe DVDK, SRIV, etc., you'll need to do this for each node and then create a relevant network config file for, for each of those nodes. 
In this case, I can just use this template for all of them. So we've mapped our interfaces, and then finally, the last thing we're going to do is loop over all of the networks for that role and create a VLAN on top of our um, BREX network. And for the last one, if the network is the external network, then that will become our default route. So that is all we need at this point. So the next thing we're going to do is this bare metal provision. So the last thing we're going to do now is this overcloud node provision. Um, node provision. So we do open stack overcloud node provision, give it the stack of overcloud, and then include that network config flag. We're going to output a file called overcloud bare metal deployed, and we're going to pass it in that template that we just looked at with all of our node counts and our networks and our IP addresses. So the dash dash network config flag will ensure that we actually go out and we actually configure those bare metal nodes with our network config. And that puts us in a great position for then going and um, running our overcloud deploy. So finally, after this command has finished executing, you'll be left with this file. So you can see here, notes deployed successfully, add the following file to your deployed environment. So if we open this file. This has all the information that you would traditionally have included in your nodes data file, where we have the node counts, the host name format. We have the deployed server port map, where we, where we put in our control plane ports. These will become the ports we use for management. So using Ansible to uh, log into those, those specific ports. We have the hostname map, so we're mapping the metalsmith nodes that we just imported but not managing to our overcloud nodes. And then we have our node port map. And this has all the IP addresses that will be used during the deployment. And then finally, uh, a resource registry that's generated for us that tells Heat how to use those deployed ports since it can't talk to Neutron. So then we just want to take these files and edit our deploy command. And we just want to add these in here. So anywhere is fine, really. Uh, so that, that's an original one. So we'll replace these three files. Just paste that in for now. And now those files have been included in our deployment, so we could go ahead at this point and run our deployment. But I actually don't like the way this file is looking, so I want to make a couple of changes here, and I want to leverage the answers file. So we do open stack over cloud deploy dash dash help. So if we do OpenStack Overcloud Deploy dash help and grep for answer, we can see that it, it provides the ability to use an answers file. So what I want to do is actually leverage this answers file to rewrite some of our Overcloud Deploy stuff. So we'll just go vim templates answers.yaml. And in here we're going to put templates, user, share, OpenStack, triple O, heat templates. And we'll put environment. And we're going to put all of our environment files in here, which will just make it a little bit easier to, to read, comprehend. It's all a little bit neater. So we'll open up this file again. We want to copy all of these. And we want to go into our answers file. Now we just need one new line for each of these, right? So we'll do set paste again. And we will paste them in here. So now what we can do is we can just we can essentially just do this. So we'll move them all back so they're in line here. Then we will do this and just delete that. And now we have a, a neater way of providing all these environment files. So we edit our deploy command again. We can now replace all of these files that we've just removed and instead just pass in answers file. Do answers file and we want to 
So it was home stack templates answers file.yaml. No, answers.yaml. Answers.yaml. Okay, so I think at this point we are probably ready to try and run an overcloud deploy and see if this works. So let's so we're in a team lock session, that's great. Let's see it into our templates directory. And we're gonna run bash deploy deploy. So now we're gonna start this overcloud deployment and see how this goes. So we've already failed. Why did we fail? Ah, you know what it is? Let's go and edit our answers file again. Okay, so at the end of every line in this file, I've left all of the backslashes and that's actually what's breaking it. So let's go and fix that now. So we'll do percent s forward slash dot dollars forward slash forward slash g. So that will delete. I'm going to delete the last character on every line, but I guess we don't really want that, do we? There we go. So that will go and replace the backslashes with nothing. So we run that. We've now removed our backslashes. So let's go and try our deploy command again. So templates, network environment, overcloud. So it's saying it can't find these two files. So let's check. The one definitely exists. So we'll look in here again. So it's complaining about this one. So I think the problem here is the tilde. I don't think we can expand that. So we'll change that to home stack templates. And the other one that it complained about is the container image prepare file. So for that, we can go back to our documentation and we'll use this one since we don't need it anymore. We'll go back to our deploy guide. Uh, deployment. So we go to container image preparation. So we can see here that we generate a file that spits out all the defaults and we're gonna put it in that directory. So now I didn't wanna include this file in my Git repo. I generally put this into the home stack file because sometimes I need to put uh, credentials at the top of it. But for this case, we're just gonna leave it the defaults and see how we go with that. So let's go back to our templates directory now and do bash deploy deploy and we will see if we can get the deployment started this time so we still have some error here following files are not found home stack containers prepare parameter so containers uh, parameters dot yen So we'll recreate that file. So I generally keep this file in my home directory instead of in the templates and part of the Git repo because sometimes I need to put credentials in it. But once we have this file, so we can cat the containers prepare parameters.yaml file. That's the file we've created. So we need to make sure that this is the file that it references in our answers file now. So we vi into templates and answers yaml down here. I I think there's an S in here somewhere in the file I just created. So we do home stack and then that. So in our containers prepare profile, this is using all of the upstream images in this case. So this is using things directly from Quay. Now I've fairly slow internet here, so I would prefer to host these locally. So what we can do when we run that command is add local push destination to it and we'll output to the same file and we'll see what difference this makes. So we can see this is now added push destination true. Now that means that we're going to be pushing all of the files to our undercloud system and the undercloud itself is going to be our container registry. So we go back here 
and we take a look at the, the next step that we need to run. Scroll down, 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 down. So we're going to run OpenStack Triple O Container Image Prepare and we're going to pass it in that file and that's actually going to push them all to our local registry on the undercloud now. So this will take a while so we will pause and come back once this is finished. So that's still running for me at the moment but I thought this is probably a good opportunity to show how we can follow along with those logs and see what it's up to. So you can see there it tells us where to check the logs which is handy. So we go to another tab and we do CMOX, uh sudo tail f and we paste that so this will show us what it's actually up to which is a little bit more satisfying than just waiting for something to finish so we're downloading ironic inspector neutral metadata so we're getting an error here because we need to authenticate against quay for this bgp agent container for some reason so I don't think I particularly want to fix that. So what I might do is just exclude that. So we'll go back to our documentation. So I'm not just doing things randomly. And we'll search for excludes. So what we can do is put that in an excludes list. So we want to be under the push destination at this level. We want to do excludes. And we're going to make a list here and we'll paste in that container. So OVN BGP agent. So I mean I don't need a BGP agent on your own BGP, so I assume I should be fine to skip that. So we'll just run that again now. And we'll just see if that gets us past that issue. Okay, so our container image prepare has finished there now. So here. We should have our container image prepare file, which is this one. So now that's going to get included into our deploy command and we're just skipping that OVN BGP agent since we don't seem to have permission to access that container for some reason. So we'll go back to our templates directory and we're going to run bash deploy deploy and let's see how far we get now. Once we figure out these teething issues with our new scripts and everything that's relevant for this environment, we will we might create a new branch in the Git repo and we'll push all of these changes to that new branch. And that way we can keep that branch specific for the CNV environment. If we have wanted to deploy a bare metal one again, we can go back to the other branch. Okay, so we failed there, and it looks like this is probably a deprecated service. So if we go into roles data yaml, and we just search for that. So, you know, in every release, we're trying to clean up and deprecate these services that are no longer used, and I'd say that is one of those examples. We'll rerun it again. If you wanted to check something like that, it'd be easy to find in the Git repo. I'm just fairly confident that Scale.io has been deprecated, so I'm just going to remove it and rerun my deployment, so we'll see how this goes. And this is, this is an example of why you want to try and stick as closely as possible to the default version of Triple O Heat Templates and only make the changes that you need for your environment because then you're going to get all these updates that get pushed through our, our change process that are all tested in CI environments you know, you're going to get the best experience if you make minimal changes to our templates and just customize the environment files. So we've got another one, so Cinder backend Dell VMC vFlex. So we'll delete that one as well. Um, you know, I, the, the reality is in my environment, I'm actually not going to need any of these. So, I mean, I can just get rid of them. So let's just check the rest of the file now. Yeah, so we look good there. Let's try again. So when you're creating a custom role, one thing that we could do to overcome this is I could diff the roles data file that's provided in user share OpenStack triple heat templates against my custom roles file which 
in all honesty, I don't actually need any more because I'm not using that compute Dell role. That was for the physical Dell, which obviously we're not deploying here. So I could just use the default roles file, which would save me all these all these hassles. But let's see if this makes it through. If it doesn't, we'll default back to the default roles data file. So performing heat step create, this is a great time to talk about ephemeral heat and what, what that means for you and your environments moving forward. So ephemeral heat. In traditional Red Hat OpenStack platform and Triple O, we have deployed the heat service on the undercloud and we've used that to manage the state of the overcloud environment. So we create a heat stack that keeps track of all the resources, all the indexes, all the networks. And every time you want to make a change, we make that change via heat templates. So heat would then process that change and go and deploy the difference. Now, with ephemeral heat, and because we, we had some issues where that could be a cumbersome process to troubleshoot, or you know someone might make a change outside of heat, which is then very hard for heat to consolidate because it can't you know keep track of all these manual changes that are happening. So what we would end up with is people in situations where they would run an overcloud deploy and we were unable to perform the update to that heat stack. Sometimes that required manual database modification because obviously we don't want to delete the heat stack. We've got a deployed cloud that's running you know thousands of VNFs and customer workloads, so we don't want to delete the heat stack. But we need to hack it back into shape, and that's not ideal. When you're when you're trying to make database hacks, you you might be missing relation chains in the database. You might be missing various things that are required, and it could cause further problems. Maybe not immediately, but maybe during the next update or further down the line. You know, we don't want to do that. So, the effort behind ephemeral heat is to really simplify this process and make it as user friendly as possible and make your environments as reproducible as possible. So heat obviously gives you that advantage of being able to reproduce things consistently. Um, so what we're using it for now in ephemeral heat is we basically take your environment files and any templates that are passed in, we create a heat stack, and then we spit out the outputs which are the Ansible playbooks. And those Ansible playbooks go into what we call config download, so they're downloaded, and then we execute Ansible, Ansible playbook to go out and deploy that state to the environment. So heat is really just there as a translation mechanism between triple heat templates, environment files that everyone is used to and everyone is comfortable using, to Ansible playbooks where we can then go and deploy that information. Now we don't just do Ansible, we take your higher data for example and we push that into a bunch of Ansible variables that are then used to by Puppet to configure your configurations on the overcloud. So there's a fair bit of complexity and I don't think we would want to, at this point, move away from heat and the mechanisms that it provides to do this. It would be quite an abrupt change and it could make the deployments a fair bit messier. So this is kind of the, the happy middle ground where we can start heat up, heat will process our templates and environment files, spit out an outcome and then heat goes away and it's, it's completely gone, it doesn't keep state at all. So the next time you run over cloud deploy, it's still doing a create, it's doing create in progress, it's never ever doing an update in progress. Which means that we can make changes that we couldn't before, and we have a bit more flexibility in the way we manage our over clouds, and we have removed some of that complexity that's involved in debugging environments. Now obviously some of the downside is that when we start heating that pod it can't talk to Ironic and Neutron, which is why we needed to go through the whole process that we've been through up until this point to configure those bare metal nodes, those networks, those VIPs, and then we include those files in our deployment so that heat is able to use pre-deployed everything and it doesn't need to contact any other OpenStack services. It just goes and creates the stack and spits out what we need. So what we'll see is heat will go through this creating pro uh, creating progress section and it will eventually come to create complete for the entire stack and at that point config download will start and we'll just see some Ansible output on our screen and heat will go away in the background. Now all of this is then downloaded into a directory so that if we needed to troubleshoot we can and the documentation for ephemeral heat and a more detailed explanation of everything I've described is here but if you wanted to find the information we can go to our other tab, for example, and we go to our home directory. We can see here we now have this overcloud deploy directory. So if we go into overcloud deploy and overcloud, this has the information that we're deploying. So we have heat launcher, for example, 
and now it's creating a backup of our heat database. So once heat is finished, that will be a valid backup of a database. If we need to restore it and check the database, that's where we can find it. All the files relevant to heat are in here. If we need to debug anything, we can go into log, and we've got all the logs from heat there that we can go through and take a look and debug things as needed. So what heat is deploying is this pod. So we deploy the ephemeral heat pod, and we start the heat engine in one of them, we deploy the heat API, start the API, and we mount in these directories that we're looking at now, so these directories here. So that's how we would debug the, the heat process. And what we will see is that we have a rendered version of our AAA heat templates directory. So for example, in here we now have rendered versions of these files, so in user share OpenStack AAA heat templates network for example these are the unrendered versions of the file so you'll note we have things like networks j2.yaml whereas here we have the rendered networks.yaml so if we want to look at networks.yaml and see what it's rendered we can see the information here and that's taken from our templates and our environment files and it's rendered into something that is usable by heat during the deployment so that gives us another point that we can come in and debug should we need to so I think heat has probably finished now. So yes, heat has finished now. We can see that we've moved on to the Ansible component and we're downloading that config now. So that is this config download directory here. So we go into config download and overcloud. We can see here, these are all the playbooks that will be executed to deploy this environment. Um, so this is the outcome of that heat stack. And this is ultimately where we can perform debugging steps without recreating the heat stack. Now we can rerun the Ansible playbook command to deploy against this environment. And you'll notice I've got customizations that are still here. For example, my compute Dell role still exists because I didn't remove it from my roles data file before running this deployment. It just won't be used because we don't have a compute Dell count one, for example. So we'll go back to our deployment window and it, there we go, so we have failed. It looks like there might actually be a compute del count role one. So let's go have a look at that. So templates, role starter, compute del. Okay, so we have a count default of one here. So the reason that's failed is because it's tried to deploy one compute del node, and that's obviously not going to work in this environment. So we'll change that to zero, and we will just simply rerun it now. Normally, in an, in an OpenStack deployment, a tri triple O Red Hat OpenStack platform deployment, this would now be doing a stack update, not a stack create. So let's keep an eye on this and see what happens when the stack gets created. So we can see there, for example, it is performing the heat stack create and it's overriding the previous overcloud deployment status YAML file. So we're just recreating now. We're not doing that update. We can see there, create in progress, stack create has started. It's not a stack update. And this is what I was referring to. So we'll just sit here and watch this stack create again, and then we will see how we go. So we can see that heat is finished again there. So we've moved into the config download section. So this is where we're generating that Ansible inventory. This is where we failed last time because it couldn't find a port on the control plane for the compute Dell role. So let's see if we get past this, this uh, stage this time. Looks like we have. So once that, yep. Yeah. That looks good. So let's go to here now. So in the overcloud directory, what we can see is it's created a triple O Ansible inventory file. So this is the inventory that's used for our Ansible playbook at this stage. 
So we have all the information we need at this point to run the Ansible playbook manually. But again, this command will generate that bash script that we can use to execute the playbook should we need to. Okay, so the problem we hit here is that the network config was trying to configure the default route via, via the VLAN, which is the same problem we saw on the undercloud. So to fix that, what we're going to do is go into OS net config config.yaml and we see here we configure our VLAN 4 as a, a VLAN and that's the one we're trying to default route via as well, right? So what we need to do is we need to move that into our BRX bridge. So what we'll do is we'll go down here and we'll copy all this. So we'll just D on that, come up here, paste that in and we're a few spaces across, so indent it correctly. Okay, so now we're going to set that IP address directly on the bridge, which is BRX. We're still going to leave the VLAN there because I still need to troubleshoot that issue. But what we can do is osnet on p dash c on that dash v v so we can get some output. So now we want to make sure the IP address has moved from VLAN 4 to BRX is the plan. And that should allow us to reach our gateway. And I'm hoping that the other VLANs, because they're all happening internally on the hypervisor, they won't need whatever this problem is to be fixed. I'm hoping it will all work internally, but we will, we will find out. So IPOA. So we can see that BREX now has that IP address and IP route. Okay, we're still default routing via that. So we need to edit that file again. Now I think this is because we're using DHCP true. So we'll do def route false here. And we'll just rerun it. We'll see if that fixes that problem. Because the DHCP offer is going to be telling it to use that as the default route. So that has now removed that default route, but it hasn't added our new one. Let's go double check everything. Def route true. Routes next hop. That looks right. Okay, so I can ping the gateway. Can I ping the internet? I can ping the internet. I guess the other problem is that I don't have anything in... Ah, so... <laughs> so this is obviously also coming from DHCP and from the fact that it's running in OpenShift. We're trying to use core DNS as our, as our DNS server, which we don't want. We want to get rid of that. We want to use name server. One, no ping, google.com again. Okay, that resolves now and we can ping it. So that, that's the change we needed. So we'll go back here. We need to change that network config file. So in the config file, we wanted to make sure that our IP address gets put onto our external bridge. So what we do up here, in the OBS bridge section. I've just added in the IP address and then we're doing a lookup on the variable networks lower for the external network because we only want the external IP and the external CIDR. So that will add the IP address to our bridge. And then down here, when we do the network configuration, we still want that VLAN 4, but we just want to make sure we don't add an IP address to it. So I've added another if statement down here where we do if network is not equal to external, then we go through and we iterate through each of the uh, networks and we add in the IP addresses. So once that is done, we can rerun the node provision with the network config option. And we'll just select yes when it prompts us to override things. And if we go to my other TMUX tab, I've already gone through and done this, so we can go and have a look at our overcloud nodes. So we can see here that the IP address on the 172.20.0.0/16 network is on BRX now. VLAN 4 does not have an IP address, which is what we want. And 
um, we're not going to be able to ping just yet. So I think for this problem that I'm experiencing, I've removed the trunk native VLAN 4 that was on the port channel and I've just set it up as a trunk port. So then what I'm going to do, let's see, on the bridges that we're creating on the hypervisor, I'm just going to create one bridge per VLAN. So you can see here I've created VLANs uh, 1 and 4 and then a bridge for VLAN 1 and 4 as well. So we look at this one for example. So you can see there that I've set up ENO 2.1 and I'm creating it as a VLAN interface on ENO 2. So I'm just going to do that for each of the VLANs. We will attach individual bridges, so one bridge for each of the networks we're using on the overcloud to our virtual machines and then we'll rerun the network deployment. At the moment this is going to work, well as you can see it does work, but it just means I can't communicate between the nodes. So an actual overcloud deployment is always going to fail in this scenario. So I will wrap up this video there and leave it at that since we've explained the bare metal provisioning process and then in the next one I will have added in all the extra bridges and VLANs, reconfigured the virtual machines to use them all and we'll look at rewriting this network config and actually doing an overcloud deployment that should work. So that has been the new process for how the overcloud deployment process begins now. We don't just start with overcloud deploy and expect heat to contact um, Nova, Ironic and Neutron and create everything for us. We go and create those in incremental steps that are easier to debug and if we have issues we can log in and debug them at those stages. Now we still have that issue with VLANs that's going to come into play in the overcloud deployment and we're going to need to fix that. So what we'll do is we'll leave this video there since that has covered the introductory steps to that deployment and talked about ephemeral heat and in the next video we'll continue with our overcloud deployment and debugging any issues that may come up there. If you have any questions in the comments below, happy to answer them and we can dive into any of these topics in more detail in another video should it be required.